We design our speakers so that they conform to the needs of the buyer rather than forcing the buyer to make massive changes in, in their living environment. One of the biggest things that the product needed to do was fit within uh, a domestic environment that didn't have a lot of space. But we were challenging ourselves at that time to give as much sonically as possible in a small package. So how do you do that? The Sasha is already a magnificent product. People might want to move on to something that has a little higher performance level. Uh, many have done that with uh, the Max Series 3. Now, these are to the same scale, so you can see uh, that the Sasha could very easily fit into a, an environment where the Max may not fit. We really wanted to have more of the functionality of the larger systems. What that was going to entail was we really needed to separate the mid-range and the tweeter module to give us some independent adjustability there. So we start looking at what we've done on larger systems, which is to have these uh, blade assemblies. It was really starting to gravitate away from more of a Sasha-like look and was kind of leaning maybe too heavily towards the Max and Alexandria. We had uh, several iterations of the system where the tweeter was completely exposed and it just didn't seem to click. Having the tweeter just sitting on top of the mid-range really, it, uh, it just didn't look right. What we decided to go ahead and do was, let's still make the tweeter separate, but let's use the side of the mid-range enclosure as the actual array. So that was kind of something we had never really done before. We have the ability to use our laser vibrometer to analyze. It revealed this character that we didn't want. One problem with it is the the you know the sonic signature of resonances in this in this uh, unsupported or or this unreinforced area here. And so as we found that, we started looking at different ways in which we could eliminate that and still keep the the topology or the structure. Then we modeled it with our uh, our three D printer and visually understand if it's still. Uh, if the visual cues still fit the end goal. And we can see that in this uh, P2 version, uh, which is currently where we're at, uh, we've got this uh, angled back, so it looks more like, uh, like the Alexandria. Uh, the sound of this uh, is uh, airier, it's uh, better dispersed, uh, and it has better stereo imaging than this uh, P1 version. form follows function. And so first we want to nail down the function of it and then we work on the form. Um, you know, if we weren't worried about propagation delay and time alignment and those things, pretty much at that point we can just design however we want it to look. And so if it looks great, throw our drivers in and we're done. The prototypes are built um, and brought into room number two. So the product's placed in its, in its position where we're going to be listening. The rooms down at the factory, they're smaller down there. They're, um, they're more uh, purpose-built to create a, a particular type of environment. That's where the gross measurements are done, 5 to 10 percent. Listening to it down at the factory, it's, is everything balanced? Does it sound like a good system should sound? By the time we get up here to the Wilson Music Room, this is a place where we're one or two percent. Does it sound like real music? That's the reward for me when you know we bring the system up here. This room, which is uh, a beautiful room to listen to music in, uh, and it tests the speaker in different ways. It's a it's a big enough room that you have to push it harder. So and then when you when you come back to the component values we're working with at this stage is you know one to two percent you change that value I could run a test and I've done you know dozens and hundreds of times in the past and it just doesn't show in the measurements we just made a change that is unquestionably superior from a musical standpoint 
and yet it didn't move the response curve the way we thought it would. The ultimate goal of loudspeaker development at Wilson Audio is not to develop speakers that will obediently follow some frequency response profile. We want it to sound uh, like real music. That's the ultimate goal here. When, uh, when we set up the experiment up here at the house, you know, we have the Sasha, and you can see the Sasha in the background. We listen back and forth between them, and, and Alexia did a little bit better than Sasha. That wasn't good enough for us. We wanted it to do a lot better. We wanted to switch over to the XLF and start hearing really significant um, similarities between the two. Um, and after a while, after we were developing the product for a while and, and fine-tuning once again, 1% at a time, one component at a time, listening to well-known music recorded in acoustical environments that we're very familiar with, we started switching back and forth between the Sasha and Alexia and we were thinking, why do we need to do this anymore? It's so much better than Sasha. And we never thought we'd say that, but it is so much better than Sasha that we stopped comparing it to the Sasha. We hooked up the XLF and we started comparing it to the XLF. You have to have a vision of what it is you want. One advantage of having many years of experience in, the, in a field, it allows you to look at what has been successful, ask yourself better questions, demand more of yourself, because you're the only one that's responsible for it. You can have great abundance of skills, but if you lack inspiration, uh, it's, it, you're never going to create greatness.